Good morning, fellow gardeners. Welcome to our Gardening with Native Plants workshop. This workshop is presented by the Master Gardeners of Placer County. My name is Donna Olson, and I will be your moderator today. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you saw in the opening slides, this workshop is being recorded and will soon be uploaded to our YouTube web website. The link to the video and any accompanying resources will be on our public website, <clears throat> PCMG ucanr.org. If you have questions during the talk, please post them in the chat list and our presenter will answer them at the end. Our presenter today is Lauren Pfeffer, who has been a master gardener since 2019 and has a wealth of knowledge about California native plants. I am sure he has a lot of helpful information in store for all of us today. So Lauren, take it away. All right, thanks, Donna. Welcome to Gardening with Native Plants. Here is an example of a very nice native plant right in front of us. This is Ceanothus or California lilac. Gardeners are community volunteers who have been trained and certified by the University of California to provide home gardeners with research-based information so that you can make informed gardening decisions we can help you with a whole variety of different things like vegetable gardening, landscape plants, your lawn or backyard orchard. So uh, feel free to uh, contact us if you have any questions. Best of all, our services are free. So if you go to our website, uh, you can either uh, call us and leave a message or you can submit questions electronically. We also have social media presence. We have some and we have some publications. Uh, in particular, our annual gardening guide and calendar is going to be available in the next uh, few weeks. This has a wealth of uh, knowledge and information about uh, gardening in the local Placer County area. So it's a great uh, gift for any gardeners uh, in, your, in your life. Uh, you can pick up the gardening guide and calendar at uh, many of the local nurseries, and uh, you can also order it from our website. Normally you'd see us uh, giving workshops like this at a public venue, like a library. You'd also see us at farmer's markets, fairs and festivals. And of course we have our annual Mother's Day garden tour in May. A lot of this has been on hold of course, but things are starting to come back. We actually now have a booth at the new Roseville farmer's market on Sundays at uh, Mahaney Park. So you can look for us there. And we are planning to do our garden fair uh, in April, on April 9th. So uh, check our website for information about that. All right, well, I just wanna give you some uh, information about what native plants are, you know, their definition, uh, why they're important and uh, their various advantages and disadvantages. So you can take advantage of those as a home gardener. Uh, here's another example of a great native. This is manzanita, which in Spanish means little apple. When these uh, fruits, these little fruits ripen, uh, they look like tiny little apples. So that's how it got its name. There's two definitions uh, for native plants. The first is kind of a, a historical definition, and that is uh, plants that were here uh, before the beginning of European exploration in the 1500s. If you look at the uh, diagram on the right, the brown shaded area is what's called the California floristic province. That's a botanical definition, but you can see that it extends up into Southern Oregon and down into Northern Mexico. Um, unfortunately, there's been a, a lot of development and human activity in California so that we've lost about 70% of the native plant habitat in California. In fact, some of the largest continuous stands of California natives actually occurs in Baja, Mexico. Nevertheless, California is still recognized as one of 36 uh, biodiversity hotspots on our planet. We have more native plants than any other state. We have more rare plants than many states have plants. And about a third of our native plants are found nowhere else in the world. The other way to think about native plants is that they're part of the local food web. That is, they have 
complex interactions with other plants, the fauna, um, soil, fungi, you know, some of these relationships we're now just beginning to understand. Non-natives don't have this complexity of interrelationship. So uh, planting a non-native, it's kind of like inviting a stranger to your backyard family barbecue. That stranger is much more likely to sit off by themselves and not interact with the other guests. The other guests, of course, are the native flora and fauna. So I just want to give you a brief appreciation for the diversity of plant communities in our state. What I'm going to do is describe five different plant communities beginning at the coast and then working our way inland. Um, keep in mind that these are only a few of the many dozens of plant communities that have been described. There is some geographic overlap, of course, between plant communities. And some plants may be members of more than one community. So if you've been out to the coast, I'm sure you've seen coastal scrub. This occurs on the lower slopes of ocean facing hills in the summer fog zone. The growth here tends to be quite dense uh, and evergreen. Some of the plants that come from this community include the ceanothus that we saw uh, on the first slide, sages, coyote brush, lupine, and monkey flower. Moving inland, we come to the chaparral. Uh, this occurs on uh, dry rolling inland hills. The plants here tend to be drought tolerant and adapted to full sun in these lean rocky soils. Uh, these soils provide good drainage typically, so keep that in mind if you're using plants from the chaparral community, they expect uh, good drainage. Some of the plants from this community include the manzanita that we saw uh, the second photograph, coffee berry, fuchsia, buckwheat, and deer grass. The riparian community is the streamside community, and these plants have evolved with essentially year-round water. So as a group, they tend to be less drought tolerant, but many of these uh, plants are quite adaptable uh, to other uh, environments. Plants from this community include willow, alder, uh, pipe vine and spice bush. The California oak woodland is kind of the uh, prototypical plant community. Um, it is characterized by these groupings of beautiful large oak trees with a broken canopy. So there's areas uh, where the sun penetrates down through the trees. Uh, this occurs on dry rolling inland hills. The soils here tend to be uh, enriched by the uh, leaf litter from these uh, beautiful trees. I'm sure you're familiar with some of these oaks, uh, including the blue oak, the black oak, the valley oak, which is the largest of our oaks, and the interior live oak. Moving to the alpine plant community, this occurs uh, up in the Sierra above the tree line. This is a very harsh environment. So the plants here uh, tend to be uh, low growing or, or dwarf woody shrubs, but there's an incredible diversity of plants uh, in this community. Um, it's difficult to grow some of these plants at lower elevation, but some are adaptable. Uh, so keep in mind that things like Dudleyas, coyote mint and irises can be adapted uh, to your backyard garden at lower elevations. And then finally, we have a desert scrub. Uh, this occurs in the uh, deserts to our south and east. Technically, it's outside of the California floristic province, but it does occur in the state of California. And there are many excellent plants from this community, including yuccas, sagebrush, bear grass, and apricot mallow. Here's some of the benefits that we'll go over uh, today about using natives, and I'll familiarize you with these uh, various uh, advantages. First of all, natives have evolved uh, in our Mediterranean climate, so they're adapted uh, to this climate. Uh, Mediterranean climates have long, dry, hot summers and cool, wet winters. Um, it's kind of the 
opposite of what you find in a lot of the United States, like the Midwest or the East Coast. In those places, the annual precipitation coincides with high temperatures in the summer. But here, it's exactly the opposite. Our greatest precipitation occurs in the winter when it's coolest, and we have almost no precipitation uh, during the hottest months. Um, many of the native plants uh, that uh, we use in gardening uh, can uh, tolerate this pattern because they're adapted to it and need very little supplemental irrigation once they're established. The key there though is that they have to be established. So uh, for that first or second dry hot summer, uh, almost all natives will need some supplemental irrigation. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Less maintenance is generally involved with natives. Uh, they typically don't need fertilizer or pesticides. If you choose and locate your plant properly, uh, pruning is kept to a minimum. And as we just discussed, uh, irrigation expenses and work is usually less. If you do have to use chemical products in your garden, uh, please make sure to always read and follow the instructions on the labels. Native plants have evolved with native pests. So they have uh, developed defenses to many of these uh, critters. And um, so you can generally get by without using pesticides. Additionally, uh, this has the benefit of avoiding the killing of beneficial insects like pollinators, and it helps uh, keep toxins out of our watershed. Native wildlife uh, has evolved with native plants and may prefer native plants for uh, nectar and pollen. So planting natives uh, may help attract wildlife uh, like pollinators to your garden. Additionally, planting, nat planting natives can help support the local ecology by being a bridge between the remaining wildlands in the area. Many gardeners that plant natives uh, get a lot of satisfaction from knowing that uh, they're reestablishing, even to a small degree, uh, native plant communities uh, in their area. All right, so once you've decided that you want to have a garden and maybe use some natives, what are some principles you should think about when you're going to incorporate natives? First thing to think about is when they bloom. Um, so if you look at this list, you can see that these different plants bloom at different times of the year. So if you choose different ones from these different groups, you can provide almost year round nectar, pollen, fruit, seeds, nesting and covering site. So this can be very attractive uh, to uh, wildlife uh, in the area. You always wanna make sure that you put the right plant in the right place. So uh, if you know uh, the soil type that your plant is adapted to, it's sun and ex shade exposure requirements, you can make sure that you put it in the right place. Uh, at the end, I'll show you a website that has a wealth of information uh, to allow you to choose uh, proper plants and get information about all natives. Uh, when you're putting plants uh, in the garden, it's a good idea to group them together by their water requirements. That's called hydrozoning, and that allows you to adjust the uh, irrigation uh, requirements very easily. If you mix them up, you may tend to overwater some and underwater others. So it's useful to group them. Layering is an important concept. And this means providing plants at all different vertical levels. So grasses and ground cover, herbaceous plants, shrubs, small trees, large trees. This layering effect uh, is very attractive to wildlife and will bring uh, pollinators and other critters into your yard. Uh, you always want to make sure that you know how large your plant's going to get when you put it in the ground. Uh, many of these natives can get quite large, so you want to be careful and make sure that you put it in, a, in the right place so it has enough room, so it doesn't crowd out your other plants and doesn't require you to constantly prune it to keep it under control. Uh, this website we'll go over at the end also has information about this. All right, so once you've decided that uh, you've got a plan, what are some things to think about when you're actually installing the garden? The best time to put natives in is fall when the uh, rains return. 
Uh, they can be planted at other times, uh, depending on the, the plant, but you're more likely to be successful if you wait until uh, the rains begin. Uh, one gallon plants are preferred to the larger five gallon plants, believe it or not. Uh, the one gallon plants are less expensive and within two or three years, typically they're bigger than the five gallon plants. Five gallon plants have spent more time in the pot and are more likely to become root bound and you wanna avoid uh, uh, root bound plants. So if you can examine the plant before you buy it, uh, if you can't actually take it out of the pot, if you move the media around at the top of the pot, you can see whether or not there are any encircling roots. And then take a look at the drainage holes at the bottom of the pot. If you see a lot of roots poking out through the drainage holes, that's another indication that the plant may be root bound and it's probably better to pass that one up. This last consideration is a matter of some controversy among experts, but there's reason to believe that this may be beneficial, and that is washing the roots of the nursery media and then planting it in unamended native soil. Unamended means you haven't added any compost or fertilizer, or anything like that. Um, the reason, there's a couple of reasons to believe this is beneficial. The first of which is that roots and water have difficulty penetrating soil interfaces. Soil interfaces occur where two different soil types meet. Uh, nursery media uh, has a, usually a very large amount of organic material, which is great for growing seedlings, but most of our native soils, particularly here in the foothills, have very small amounts of organic uh, material. So when you put a plant from the nursery in nursery media, in their native soil, you're creating an interface between that nursery media and the uh, native soil. And that may interfere with the extension of roots out into the native soil. And it may interfere with uh, movement of water uh, you know, into the uh, root zone uh, initially. Uh, the other thing to think about is that although organic material is great for growing seedlings, it decomposes over time. So as that organic material decomposes, the plant will settle below grade, and that can be very harmful to the plant. The root crown, which is the kind of flared section of the plant, either at the uh, bottom of the trunk or the stem, it's kind of the junction between the stem uh, and the roots. This needs to be above grade, a half an inch or an inch. And if you uh, uh, with, with the decomposition of the uh, organic material in the, the nursery media, that may settle over time and, and may interfere with the establishment of that plant. This uh, washing off of uh, nursery media has now been pretty firmly established for trees. Uh, more research needs to be done with uh, woody and herbaceous plants, but uh, there's reason to believe that this may become a common practice eventually. All right. When you actually put them in the ground, you want to make sure the hole is about twice as wide as the pot and about half again as deep. It's a good idea to fill the hole up completely with water before you put the plant in and let that water settle. That helps hydrate the surrounding soil so you're less likely to have difficulty with the root ball drying out. Uh, roughing up the sides and bottom of the hole will help root penetration out into the native soil. And like we talked about, you want to make sure you keep that root crown a half or even a full inch above grade. You want to gently tamp the soil down around the root ball and water it in. You don't want to compact the soil too much, so you don't want to stamp on it with your foot. Uh, one way to uh, settle in the soil without compaction is what's called mudding in. This just means kind of flooding the whole area with a lot of water. And as that water percolates uh, through, it'll help settle the uh, soil without compacting it. When you compact soil, you get rid of the uh, air pores uh, that occur uh, in soil naturally. And believe it or not, roots need air just as much as the uh, leaves and stems need air. So you, you wanna have these air pores and, and you don't wanna get rid of them by compacting the soil. Mulch is almost always a good idea. It helps moderate soil temperatures, so it'll keep it warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer. It helps prevent the formation of a soil crust, 
when irrigation water comes in contact with bare soil, it may form this crust on the surface, which then becomes kind of impenetrable to additional water. So mulching helps uh, reduce that chance. It also helps keep dust down, reduce erosion, and it'll help you keep your weeds under control. Plants from the chaparral woodland and forest communities prefer organic mulches like wood chips, bark, and leaves. Plants from the seashore and desert uh, communities prefer inorganic mulches like rocks and gravel. You may also want to consider leaving a few bare spots in your garden, you know, unmulched areas, uh, because the majority of our native bees are actually solitary ground nesting bees. They don't live in hives like the imported African honeybee. All right, once you've got the plants in, now you got to think about how you're going to maintain them. And the number one issue is irrigation. This is the number one reason why uh, native plants uh, fail. Um, typically, you don't really need to do a much pruning. You actually want to avoid doing too much pruning in that first uh, year or two. Uh, pruning can stimulate uh, growth of stems and leaves. And what you want to have happen during that first or second season is you want the roots to grow. You can always remove, remove a dead, damaged, or diseased parts of the plant. Those are the three Ds. You can do that at any time of the year. Uh, fertilizer is usually not necessary for native plants, uh, but mulching is usually a good idea. And if you have a good source of high quality compost, perhaps compost that you're making yourself, occasionally, uh, ap occasional applications of this uh, is not a bad idea. It's a good idea to just leave leaves uh, where they are. They provide uh, a uh, mulching function. Uh, leaving some hollow stems, deadwood and snags is also useful because these are overwintering sites for many beneficial insects like pollinators. So the first three months is really important when you're putting natives in. You want to make sure that you keep that root ball moist. Um, the native natural rains may provide that, uh, but if you're not sure, you want to check that root ball with your finger and if you need to uh, add additional automated irrigation or just hand water the plant to make sure it doesn't dry out because of course it can still be quite dry and hot in October um, even after the first rain comes. Uh, for the remainder of the first year it's a good idea to deep water every uh, two or three weeks. <clears throat> Again if you're not sure manually checking the soil is the best way to make sure. And then after that year you may be able to get by with no irrigation or perhaps uh, even uh, deep watering just once a month. So just keep an eye on the plant and usually they'll tell you what they need. Realize that again, these natives have evolved uh, and are adapted to uh, surviving on natural rainfall alone. So keep that in mind. Um, many natives, not all, but, but many of them have developed a uh, adaptation or defense mechanism to survive our long, hot, dry summers, and that is summer dormancy. So you may have seen our native buckeye trees that uh, lose their leaves, you know, uh, in early summer. And this is one of these adaptations called summer dormancy. So keep that in mind. Uh, your natives may get a little shaggy looking. They may turn, parts of them may even turn yellow or brown. Um, but you should expect that to some degree, depending on the plant. Uh, resist the temptation to attribute that to underwatering. Uh, you don't want to overwater during uh, this, the hot, warm months because that'll promote fungal diseases, which um, natives are, are very uh, susceptible to. They're really not adapted to, to defend themselves against warm, uh, wet conditions. Drip irrigation is usually preferred. Uh, as the plant grows and the roots extend out into the native soil, you wanna move those emitters away from the plant out to the drip line. And you'll probably have to add additional emitters around the plant uh, to keep it uh, well irrigated. Here's a few books that uh, are useful. Uh, if you go to our website, there is a link to a PDF document that lists these uh, books, as well as a number of websites mm. uh, that can uh, be helpful to you as a source of information. And one of the 
greatest websites is the Calscape uh, website. And I thought I would just take you there and uh, show you around uh, the website so you can get a feel for uh, how to use it and all, all the different information that uh, may be available to you. So hopefully you'll be able to see this now. Uh, this is calscape.org. It is run by the California Native Plant Society. And you can see that the plants are grouped by type of plant, uh, sun and shade requirements, water requirements, uh, the purpose that they're gonna fulfill in your garden. Uh, so it's very useful. Uh, you can see that they uh, recognize almost 8,000 plants native to California. So that's uh, quite a few. One neat feature about this website is that you can enter an address or a city uh, into this bar right here. And let's just enter Auburn and see what comes up. And you'll see that uh, when you restrict it to a, a smaller area, it gets a little bit more um, manageable. So in the Auburn area, they recognize about 800. So you're going down from 8,000 to 800. So that's uh, a little bit more manageable. Let's open up uh, one of these files here and see what it uh, shows us. So I'm going to click on the uh, shrubs tab and this will open the various shrubs, 122 here that are native to Auburn. And if we just look at the first one, this Western Redbud, let's open that file and see what we can see. So hopefully you can see this now. On the left, there's some uh, beautiful uh, pictures. Uh, you may be familiar with the Western Redbud. It is one of the uh, first plants to flower in the late winter, early spring. Uh, on the right, the yellow shaded area is the native habitat for this plant. And then down below the photographs, there's a little uh, link here to the nurseries that carry this plant. So if you click on that, it'll bring up a, another uh, map here that has a list of various mm. uh, nurseries. If you hover over these little uh, red squares and click on them, it'll bring up the information for that particular nursery. It's a good idea to contact the nursery uh, before you go to make sure that they have uh, what you're interested in. All right, let's go back to the red bud. And now if we scroll down, we can see that there's all types of information about this particular plant. So it'll tell you how large it's gonna get, uh, when it's dormant, uh, when it flowers, the wildlife it supports, uh, its sun and shade requirements. Uh, it also tells you which foothill community or which community it came from uh, and what it's uh, adapted to. So that's all really useful. If we go back to the very top of the uh, uh, page here, you can see that there's a butterfly tab and if you click on this butterfly tab, it shows you all the butterflies native to uh, your particular area. Again, since we put in Auburn, it's restricting us to just the Auburn area. But this is kind of cool if you're interested in uh, attracting pollinators like butterflies, uh, this is really fun. Uh, let's open the painted lady here and you can see it's very similar to the uh, plant page, you have some beautiful photographs on the left, so that can help you identify uh, the uh, butterfly. On the right, again, the yellow shaded area is its native habitat. And then if you scroll down here, there's a list of plants, and these are called host plants for this particular butterfly. Host plants are the plants on which the adult lays her eggs and on which the larvae feed. Uh, and then grow and turn into adults. So if you're interested in attracting this particular butterfly, you would want to plant some of these plants to attract it. And so you can go through different butterflies and find out which host plants uh, work for them and uh, have fun attracting butterflies. All right, the last thing is, let's see, at the very top again, there's this advanced search uh, link. And if you click on that, 
it'll bring up a uh, kind of a checklist of different requirements. So if you are looking for a plant that has specific requirements, uh, sun requirements, drainage requirements, uses, you can even um, look at flower color, you can restrict it to a certain size of plant. So this advanced search function uh, can be uh, very helpful if you're uh, trying to find a, a particular uh, plant. All right, so that's the Calscape website. Uh, and now, uh, I think we'll go through questions. So if you have any questions, go ahead and enter them into the uh, chat box and we'll, we'll go through those. If after the presentation's over, you have any questions, uh, please uh, give us a call or go to our website and uh, you can submit questions electronically. All right, thanks for attending today. Uh, I'll turn it back over to Donna and we'll go through your questions. Take it away, Donna. Oh, thank you, Lauren. That was great. Um, but you know what? I do not see any questions in our chat. Oh, okay. At this well, that's, time. That's good. I must have answered them all. You must have. It was perfect. <laughs> so any, oh, there we we're seeing people saying great presentation, which it definitely was, <clears throat> but I am not seeing any questions. So, okay. Uh, anyway, thank you for sharing your expertise on native plants. I'm really excited. I'm trying to get my whole front yard done in native plants. And so I'm trying to come up with a plan and I keep watching all of these uh, classes on it, trying to uh, figure out what to do. Um, I do see one question that came in. It's from Elena Archibald. And she says, are local natives better than natives from other areas? Well, um, you can use natives from other areas as long as they're adapted to, uh, you know, this where, wherever you live. Um, you can look on the Calscape website and that can help you um, uh, make sure that the plant will uh, succeed in your area. Uh, but they're pretty adaptable. Uh, you just want to make sure that whatever that plant uh, whatever community it belongs to is the same or pretty close to what we have here. Okay, um, Ruby would like to know, uh, she says she may have missed the announcement, but when, but will the slides be available? Uh, yes, the, the presentation itself is actually uh, already on YouTube. We did this last year. So if you wanna watch it again, you can just go to our YouTube channel, which is uh, Placer County MGS, uh, and you can watch it there. Uh, we will also be posting a PDF file of the actual PowerPoint slides uh, soon. Okay. Donna, I see one more question. Uh, this is Shelly. Uh, so is Chaparral for our area? Uh, yeah, or Oak Woodland. You know, Placer County is so unique because it goes all the way from almost the valley floor up to you know, above the tree line. So it depends on where you are uh, in, in elevation to determine, uh, you know, what plant community you're in. Uh, I'm here in Newcastle and this is technically a blue oak woodland. Okay, um, I see one more from Jim. It says, is the hotline always available? Yes, it is. Uh, you, you can leave you leave a message and then um, those messages are, are retrieved by master gardeners three or four times a week and answered. So if you leave it on the weekend, it, you have to wait till I think Monday is the first day when they'll uh, take those uh, calls in. OK, and oh, here's another one. Does California lilac do well here or only along the coast? Uh, I have it and it does well here. Yeah, in, in the spring, you see them all over the place Beautiful. around here. And we're, we're down here in Rockland. Yeah, but they can get big they <laughs> depending do. on the okay. variety. So be careful. <laughs> okay, anybody else? 
One person, Jan, said, great presentation. A fellow Sacramento master gardener and I are getting a similar presentation together for our area. You gave us some great ideas. So great. thank you for that. Glad to hear it. <laughs> OK, well, let me remind all of you participants that in the next couple of days, you will find a link to the handouts and to this workshop on our uh, website, PCMG ucanr.org under the heading virtual gardening workshops. You can also check our listing there for future workshops under upcoming events. <clears throat> Please remember that if you live in a different county or a different area of the world to consult your local master gardeners or other experts about geographical or climatic differences in your garden. Thank you all so much for participating today. We sure hope to see you soon at another one of our virtual workshops. Thank you.